Idle champions of the Forgotten Realms. Quite the mouthful, isn't it? But what is it? As the title may have hinted to you, it's a free-to-play idle game. A unique genre full of a whole lot of games that, quite honestly, aren't worth your time. But with an occasional gem. You might be surprised to see me cover it, considering the usual type of game I tend to make a video on. But the simple fact is, this idle game is one of those rare gems. It's chock full of interesting characters, mechanics to learn, and challenges to face. This game takes the framework the company, Codename Entertainment, made from their previous game, Crusaders of the Lost Idols, and gives it a fresh coat of Dungeons & Dragons paint. You'll see familiar names and faces from characters you know from established lore, and popular campaigns you may be following. So, settle in, because I have plenty to talk about with this one, ranging from base mechanics to the more complicated endgame strategies. If you're here for something specific, timestamps are there for you. So let's start with the simplest concept of this game. You go right. Like a Mario. So what stops you from going right? The enemies going left. You clash in the middle, and whoever deals more damage is victorious. You will have five levels in each area to progress through, and every fifth level will be a boss encounter. But be careful because there are plenty of different enemy types to run into, like those that are melee, ranged, or spellcasters, and they have various types of health, like just a flat set health, or what's called hit-based health, where you won't be able to just one-shot them. But they are fairly easy to whittle down. And then you have the armored-based health, where you need to be able to deal a percentage of their max health in a single hit just to break one chunk of that armor. So how do you deal enough damage to kill the enemies before they kill you? It's all about the formation of the campaign and adventure you're playing, and what formation abilities the champions you have in your party are. What does that all mean? Well, let's break it down. You're going to start with no money and very little options for what champions you can use. But don't worry, You'll be making more money and seeding more champions in no time. Quick aside, I've been playing this game for years, and my main account is pretty beefed up. But also make no mistake, while I can do all of the content and have every achievement, I'm even still nowhere near the one percenters of this game. But for the sake of this video, I also started fresh on another account as well. I'm going to be hopping between both of them when I make various points. I think it will be fairly clear which one is which once things get rolling, but for your sake, the new account will have this interface, and my experienced account will use this interface. Moving on. When you start the game, you go through a little tutorial that gives you some of the basics. Our residential dwarf Bruner will guide you through them, such as click damage, champion damage, and the fact that you can spend your gold to upgrade both by leveling them up. Upgrading a champion gives them more health so they can take more of a beating, as well as increasing their damage. You will also eventually unlock an ultimate attack for each champion that is unique to that champion and has a durational cooldown. Also, I personally recommend turning on scientific notation for your damage numbers, as the numbers get astronomically high. In my opinion, it's far quicker to understand your damage output with this on. For simplicity's sake, for those who don't know, the E number just means how many times you move over the decimal, right? So if your damage is 2.55 E4, that's 25,500. And if it's 2.55 E5, that would be 255,000. The bigger the number, the better. So let's talk about formation abilities. First things first, every champion has a set amount of rolls between tanking, those who can take a decent beating before going down, healing, those who have some way to heal or give shields to champions, DPS or damage per second, those who focus on dealing damage to enemies, support, those who focus entirely on supporting others through their formation abilities, gold, those who buff your gold find so you can farm them coins, speed, those who make you progress faster through various means. Champions can have any amount of these tied to them based on how they are designed and often reflect what kind of formation abilities they will offer to the group. Let's use a champion in particular as an example. This champion is in the starting roster and has a high likelihood to not only be one of the better supports, but potentially your main DPS. As Shara the Aarakocra Wizard. She has the DPS and support tags, so depending on how you level her up, she can either be used as a damage dealer or support for another damage dealer. 
A proper formation will only ever have one DPS champion that everyone else in the formation is positioned to optimize that DPS's damage. If you try to split your damage between multiple DPS champions, you are directly working against yourself. Losing the buff potential of even one slot will be devastating to your overall output. So how can Ashara be a DPS or support at the same time? Through her specializations. The more you level up a champion, you choose a path for them to focus on based on their abilities and traits. Ashara in particular focuses on buffing certain races. Her first choices are between humans, dwarves and elves bundled together, and potpourri, which is a hodgepodge of dragonborn, aracocra, furbolg, lizard folk, minotaur, tiefling, and turtles. Oh my. She later gains a second specialization choice between half-bloods, like half-elves and half-orcs, shorties, like gnomes, halflings, kobolds, and goblins, and finally exotic races, basically everything else. Based on what she chooses, she buffs those races' damage by a rather large amount. So, how does she become a DPS? Well, she also gains a trait while leveling up, where if there are at least three of the selected races, she also gains that buff. And she can get that buff for both of her selections. So, for example, if you chose Potpourri and Half-Bloods, and you have three of each, a total of six, she doubles down on that buff for herself, making her a potent damage dealer. A lot of specialization choices are far less complicated, like with Jarlaxle. He only chooses one specialization before his maximum level, and it's between only two choices. One increases his damage, and one increases his gold find. Pretty self-explanatory. And then you have those like Morgan. Uh, Mor Morgane? I I'm not actually sure how to pronounce her name. Anyway, she is only a support and can only ever be used to buff other champions. But she has three specialization choices focused entirely on making her adaptable in both where she can be positioned and how she enhances her main buff. There are six campaigns for your champions to fight through, each with numerous adventures and variants tied to those adventures. You'll start only with the campaign A Grand Tour of the Sword Coast, but will quickly unlock the others as you progress through the adventures, which are a section of that campaign, with set enemies and progressions, and their variants, which are altered challenges of that specific adventure. The harder they are, the more rewarding they are to complete. The more gold you get within a campaign upon completing a run will increase your favor, which is a representation of the deity that watches over your champions. Each campaign has their own unique deity and favor. The higher your favor is, the higher your base gold find is. However, you can also spend your favor on blessings in the core campaigns to grant your party some permanent buffs linked to that campaign, and more importantly, a rare set of permanent buffs that are game-wide. I recommend as soon as you unlock a campaign, trying to get the first permanent buff for each, as they're all a game-wide 2 times damage increase. An overall good rule of thumb for favor, in my opinion, is to purchase everything you can up to the point where it starts just barely reducing your maximum. I'd highly recommend not spending so much that it severely reduces the gold find you've built up, as it will make it harder to progress. You can only place 9 champions in the first campaign, but in every other one you can place 10. Each campaign has their own unique formation pattern, so you will need to figure out how to best place your champions for each campaign to get your optimal DPS. There are 12 seats of champions to choose from, and every champion belongs to a specific seat. Right at the beginning, you'll only have the base champions to choose from, and we'll get into how you unlock more in just a bit, but there are a few you unlock an alternate way. These are called Evergreen Champions. Let's talk about Hitch. You can get him right away by signing up for their newsletter with an email in-game like this. I highly recommend doing this as soon as possible, as not only is Hitch actually a great support for the early game, but it also signs you up for their weekly newsletter, which will also have attached with it a special code for you that grants you a specialized gold chest. What's a chest, you might ask? It's how you get gear for your champions, but we'll also cover that in a second. Once Hitch is unlocked, you'll see he makes Seat 8 his home, which he shares with Delina. Since Delina is exclusively a damage dealer, and a fairly low tier one at that, we will probably almost always use Hitch over her to support someone else. You do that very simply, like this. And there you have it, your first new support base champion, as easy as that. But, that also means you won't be able to use Delina while Hitch is selected. 
For reference, once unlocked, each seat has eight or more champions attached to it. Right now as I'm making this video, there are a total of exactly 100 champions. The other evergreen champions are unlocked by completing special adventures within the campaigns, so get to it. As you go about completing adventures, you'll see you're not only earning gold, but gems as well. These are used for a variety of purposes, like spending them on skins for your champions or buying familiars. Familiars act as auto-clickers for you. You can assign up to six on the field of battle to act as click damage, or have them hover over a champion to level them up when possible, or even assign them to hover over ultimates and every so often use them, or even specifically assign them to one ultimate and make it use it as soon as it's off cooldown. However, gems will mainly be used for buying some of those chests we were talking about. There are two qualities of chests to buy, silver and gold. To do that, you'll have to go into the shop, where you're going to see the microtransactions. If you're keen on spending money on a game like this, watch for sales and wild offers, as they happen frequently and offer a wide array of useful things, like champions, chests for champions, gear for those champions, skins for cosmetics, familiars, etc. Know that this is certainly not required in this game, as I personally have only spent somewhere between $30 to $40 in total in my years of playing it, but only to show my support by snagging things that went on sale that I kind of wanted, you know, because I'm a poorie. What you're going to be looking for is this part of the gem shop. Also, you're going to want to start with silver chests because of the way gear works in this game. The rarity of gear goes like this. Common, 50% increase. Uncommon, 125% increase. Rare, 200% increase and epic, 350% increase. On top of that, you can also get a rare variation of shiny items, boosting that item by 50%, and golden, boosting them by 100% on top of that. Shiny is a random chance, which is very rare, and golden is often tied to either microtransactions or maybe a unique reward from an in-game event. You start with silver chests, because silver can only grant rarity up to blue but golds can get you up to epic. If you get all blue via silvers first, which are cheaper, your golds are far more likely to reward you with epic gear because it won't as frequently have the lower tiers in the loot pool if you're already at rare with your equipment. Though your goal is clearly to get full epics on your champions, it is not a bad thing to get duplicates, as the gear on your champions also have an item level, forever scaling the effectiveness of the gear and a duplicate will instead directly boost an item level of that piece of gear. For example, 25 item levels boosts the effectiveness by 10%, and getting an epic duplicate of an already epic piece will grant you 24 item level, or 9.6%. However, getting a common duplicate will only grant one level, or 0.4%. You'll see as you open chests, you get other rewards as well, like potions that grant you temporary buffs, smithing contracts you can use to increase item levels for gear directly, but also something called feats, which you will be able to equip on your champions once you level them up to a certain level. Each champion has two feat slots that unlock at different levels, but once unlocked, are permanently unlocked, and you can choose to slot any feat you own for them. You start with some very basic feats to choose from, not very good, but the more effective feats will either be found in gold chests or purchased directly with gems. While silver and gold chests are what you can buy with gems, there are various other types of chests. One of the more important ones being an Electrum chest, which could almost be considered somewhere between silver and gold. It will never have epic quality like silver, but also has a higher chance of rare quality, and will always give you one equipment item, a stack of gems, a bounty contract, a blacksmithing contract, and a potion. However, silver and gold chests will only ever drop gear for core champions and evergreen champions. Electrum chests, however, drop equipment for any champion you have unlocked in your roster. Electrum chests are gained by inputting codes into this combination system here. For a quick and easy way to get the combinations, go to their Reddit or join their Discord. People update almost instantly, and there is always a steady flow of codes for you to enjoy. You might also stumble across some combinations that give you something even more. For example, when I started my new account, there were codes to unlock three different champions, Dahani, Evelyn, and Strix. So I was able to dive into a fresh game with three new champions. 
Hunt down every code you can, as often as you can. I mentioned bounty contracts, which are a very simple item gained from chest that drop a certain amount of gold based on the rarity of the contract when used. These are far more important than you might think at a first glance, and you're going to want to hold onto them and stockpile them. Why? Because every champion that isn't core or evergreen, you know, the other 80 out of the 100, are called event champions. When a new champion is released, it is tied to a two-week event that is often linked to a season in which that champion gets their own campaign and three adventures tied to it. You also have the option to utilize that event to unlock the previous two champions that were also tied to that event. In order to run the campaigns and adventures within this event, you will need to spend a special unique currency that only exists during the event and drops alongside gold. And now you might be seeing why those bounty contracts will be saved, because using those will also drop the appropriate amount of that event's currency during the event. Some things to note about event champions. A lot of them are better with rare gear than even your core or evergreen will be while even fully epicked out. But this is certainly not always the case, as some of the event champions are quite honestly not that good, unless they get a rework, which honestly is not unheard of. Also, the campaigns will start very cheap to enter with that unique currency at first, but the cost will increase every time you run them, capping out at 2,500 of the event's currency. Each completion of at least level 50 will grant you either a silver or gold chest, randomly, specific to that champion. The adventures of their campaigns, however, have a set cost and level you need to reach, and upon completion will grant you a gold chest for that champion. There will also be five achievements tied to every event champion. The first for unlocking the champion, the second for having at least common gear unlocked in each of their equipment slots, a third for completing all of their adventures, a fourth for reaching a certain level within the campaign, and finally the fifth, having to do with a unique mechanic for that champion. For example, the most current champion when I made this video, Gazric. He has a formation ability called Armor Ablation, this makes his cold attacks reduce the threshold of an enemy armor by 15%, stacking up to 30 times. But each stack has its own duration. His achievement requires you to stack this up to 15 times on a single enemy. You're going to either need a support to increase his rate of fire, or wisely use his ult to achieve this. But it's rather simple for some of the achievements you'll come across, to be honest. A quick note about achievements, there are a lot of them, and don't forget to give them a look from time to time because every achievement you unlock will permanently increase your damage across the entire game by a small amount. Small amounts add up, believe me. So you might be thinking, if an event only has the most recent three champions, what about all of the others? They are unlocked with a different mechanic, the time gate. You will get a free time gate at least once a month, and will be able to open your own time gates occasionally with a currency item, time gate piece. Once opened, they remain open for 72 hours. A time gate is kind of an abridged version of a champion's event campaign. You will be able to free play and have access to three adventures. Completing the three adventures will net you a gold chest each, for the champion specifically. And once for every 100 levels you complete within the campaign, you will receive a silver chest for that champion. So let's say you complete all of the adventures, and between them you were able to reach level 500. You will have five silver chests, and three gold chests for that champion from that time gate. What levels you have to reach go up each time you run the same champion's time gate, so be careful you don't run the same champion too many times in a row. When you run a different champion, it will reduce the others by one bracket. Generally speaking, you can expect a time gate on a Friday, then the following Wednesday will be a new champion, and their event will last for two weeks, where there will be no free time gate. After that event is over, rinse repeat. This is not always the case, but more often than not, it is. When a free time gate comes up, you will choose from three champions the game offers you, one of which will always be one you don't own. However, if you're opening the gate yourself, you can choose from any champion, as long as their event is not the current or next upcoming event. So how do you get more time gate pieces? Well, you'll get roughly one a week randomly through drops, which isn't much. But there is one primary other way to get them, and that is through patrons. Well, what is a patron? They are prominent figures who, once you unlock, completely alter all of your campaigns, should you choose to have them active. There are four of them, Mert, Vajra, Strahd, and Zariel, each of which impose a restriction on your campaigns. 
but for every adventure you've completed, they have their own version for you to attempt again. But you'll need to push to a higher level than before, and with the restriction of whatever your current active patron imposes. For example, with Mert, you can only use good or evil champions. As this is a Dungeons & Dragons game, champions fall under the alignment system of chaotic, neutral, or lawful, and good, neutral, or evil. So if Mert is your active patron, you can only use champions like Bruner, Celeste, and Makos because they are good and evil, but you will lose access to champions like Ashara or Jamala as they are neutral. So, why complete the adventures again under harsher restrictions? Well, other than having the ability to redo adventures for even more gem gains, you will also earn influence and a currency linked to that patron, where you can unlock even more global perks, very much like blessings. Some being tied to only when you're actively using that patron, and some being game-wide. Each patron also runs their own shop to spend that unique currency, where you can get some great loot, feats, skins, familiars, or just gold patron chests with loot specifically for champions that are usable for that patron. And of course, to my original point, have weekly restocks on certain items, like time gate pieces. Every patron will also have weekly challenges for you to complete to keep their currency gains flowing, even if you're not actively completing their adventures. Once you're able to push deep into the campaign of Boulder's Gate, descent into Avernus, Avernus, a Avern, a Avern Anus, and complete a specific adventure, you'll be able to start running what's known as the Trials of Mount Tiamat. This is yet another weekly event, but one that offers the only form of multiplayer in this game. While you don't technically group together, you do join forces in a unique collaborative campaign, in which you have a challenge each day, and for every one you complete you deal more damage to the boss in order to chip away at that big boss's health, in hopes of taking it down before the week is over so you can earn some of a unique type of chest, the Glory of Bahamut chest. There is a scaling difficulty, and the hardest requires you to be able to push quite far, so make sure you don't get too in over your head and hamstring your group. Although, you're only allowed to push one difficulty bracket above what you've already been able to complete, so they pace you along the way. You also earn yet another type of currency that allows you to forge a piece of gear on a champion that is epic quality into legendary quality. This does not increase the effectiveness of that gear directly, instead it offers another unique affix to it, such as increasing champion damage by a flat percent, or a higher damage increase to a specific race. It will show you what all of the options are for that piece of gear, and if you don't like what you rolled, it can be re-rolled, or if you're quite a fan of the affix you got, you can choose to increase the level of it. However, every action will take that special currency, and every time you do anything, the cost will increase, but that cost does decrease every day. You'll see over here an option to partake in a system of Modron cores. You won't be able to unlock your first one until you have at least two champions for every seat. I'm not going to linger here because boy is it convoluted, but the big things to note are, there are three cores you can eventually unlock, each of which have different enhancements they offer to your formation. Each core can run their own group so you can have three different groups in three different campaigns running at the same time. Cores can also automate things like resetting your run so you can keep those lower levels rolling and resetting constantly to farm gems, or you can have them automate a specific formation, which is even useful for your main run so you can just have it know what champions you want out and in what slot. You can even set them to grant you a buff from one of your potions at a certain level, so get to collecting those parts, like time gate pieces primarily through patron weekly stores and restocks, and level those cores as soon as you can, because they take a lot to level up. So, now that you know all of the fundamentals, we should talk about the actual formations and some tricks you can do with them. Let's say, for example, you're like me and currently using Zorbu as your primary damage dealer. He's considered one of the top tier damage dealers currently, but that is highly up for debate, and it, it really depends on who you actually gear up. And specifically for Zorbu, how much you farm his formation ability, which scales with how many of certain enemy types you've slain over his entire lifetime, persisting through adventures and campaigns. Now, when I run into my wall, that doesn't mean it's all over at that point, because of debuffs. Some formation abilities will put a debuff on an enemy, and some of those debuffs in particular persist even when you switch that champion out. Like, for example, Isla here. She zaps enemies on the field, debuffing them and causing them to take more damage. Well, once that debuff is out, I can swap someone in her seat, 
or replace her entirely with a different one, circumstances permitting. So if I can't quite take down the enemies at my wall, I can swap her and boom, I got her debuff and the new champion's formation ability as well, allowing me to push past my wall and reach greater heights. Debuffing also opens up a different type of formation though. You'll notice early on that click damage tapers off very quickly, and will only really be useful sparingly. However, once you farm up enough gold find, you'll also find that leveling up click damage doesn't have a cap like champion levels do, and some debuffs will also affect your click damage. So yes, with enough gold find and a roster full of debuffers, your click damage has a very high chance of doing even more damage in the deep late game than your higher end damage dealers. And then there are some formation types that are built for nothing other than going as fast as you possibly can, which is incredibly important actually. If you're trying to push, you'll often have to swap out once you start hitting a wall to get better damage and push even further. But getting to that wall as fast as you can is vital. Or maybe you just want to spam farm gems at top speeds. There are quite a few champions with a speed boost, but there are two in particular I'm going to cover, and very briefly. Briv and Human, because they are incredibly important. Briv builds up stacks of, quote, steel bones when he is hit which accumulate to increase the buff he offers to every champion behind him as he is also a tank. And, side note, he's one of the best tanks in the game. However, when you complete a run, those stacks are transformed into, quote, unnatural haste, which is then consumed at a percentile rate to completely jump over an area's level. And yes, you can jump over boss levels. This skip can become not only a guarantee, but the higher you level his equipment slot that increases its effectiveness, the more levels you can skip over. For example, my Briv skips over three levels with a chance of four, guaranteed. And many, many people have their Briv much higher than mine. Also note, once you have a Modron core, if you run out of haystacks, all is not lost. You can change groups and recruit Briv into that group and either farm steel bone stacks there or have previously farmed steel bones with the first group. Finish that second group's campaign, then re-recruit Briv on your first group again with fresh haste stacks. Next up is Human, who is a little silly but a versatile champion made up of three kobolds and depending on where they are positioned offer different buffs to the group. But the only one I'm going to focus on is Zrang. Zerang? Zerang? The formation ability reduces the requirement of progression for your area's current level. So let's say you usually need 25 enemies to progress. Depending on the level of the gear slot that buffs this ability, you could reduce that number all the way down to 1. Now, that's a pipe dream for most people to get that low. But even for people who don't play this game with extreme dedication, you can easily get that one kill to count for three or five fairly easy, depending on the formation. And then there are more niche formations like the one known as Jimothy. This formation is designed specifically to beat very high levels you likely wouldn't otherwise be able to beat. This utilizes the two champions I just talked about, as well as Jim. Jim has a unique ability tied to his auto attack, where he will either stun an enemy, turn them into a mimic chest, which drops more gold, or turn them into a chicken with itty bitty health. Basically, you're setting up a formation to keep all of the enemies at bay until Jim turns something into a chicken for a quick and easy kill. So Hugh Man can make it count for a lot of progress, and Briv jumps over even harder levels. Something to note with this formation though, while it's not cheating or even exploiting, it's also not an entirely intended group of mechanics working together. It may be patched out in the future, so beware. There's also the formation of using Azaka farming, Azaka being an evergreen champion. Her ultimate ability summons two tigers that attack the enemy and make them drop gold as if they were killed. So basically what you end up doing is using every form of goldfine champion you have and use her ult for maximum goldfine gains. And then at the very end there is scripting, which honestly does feel like cheating. A lot of people are on the fence about it and a lot of people are diehard for it. I'm somewhere in the middle. It's nothing more than a scripting program to optimize a few types of runs and makes your computer do what it needs to do for those runs. Like gem farming Jimothy, or even if you just want to set it up so you'll swap Briv in to jump over boss levels. It's not technically against the rules, and their official Discord even has a server for it, so it's not going to get you banned or anything. But they've never really stated their actual opinion on it officially. So, at some point, you never know, they might just say it's against their rules. 
I only personally started scripting myself a few months ago, and I only really use it for farming gems overnight when I would otherwise be using a Modron core resetting runs anyway, or to time my Briv skips properly when I know I need to, or if I really need that Jimothy run to get past certain levels. Which honestly either comes when I want to hit the cap wall of a run, which by the way is 2000. In the past you'd get banned for reaching what the wall was, but nowadays they just stop your run there. However, I personally would also be fine if they decided it was against their terms of service. As long as they gave their players a fair warning. I know a lot of people would lose their mind, but eh, it's one of those things, you know? So, yeah, I'd do it, but also wouldn't mind giving it up if they said I couldn't. Well hey, you made it to the end of the video. It might seem a bit abrupt if you know how I usually do my videos or because you still have some questions. Well, I'm thinking about doing something I don't usually do, and that is making more videos about this game. An idle game? That's where you decide to break off and do multiple videos, Tear Deck? Are you crazy? Why didn't you do that with your two hour long Elden Ring overview slash playthrough combo video? Yeah, yeah, but hey, I make no promises. I'm working on other games too that might take precedence. Let me know in the comments if you want to hear more about this game and its champions, or want me to move on and cover something else. If you could do me a favor and place a familiar on the like, subscribe, and bell notification for me, I'd much appreciate it. Have a hell of a time out there, champions.